Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. How's everybody? What a healthy, good looking group of people. Today we go back into the book of Luke. And we're in chapter 10 where Jesus sends out the 70, which is different than sending out the 12 because it's a whole lot more. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here, to hear your word, which has been handed down to us over the generations and so exactly preserved. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus, that you sent to live a perfect life, to show us how to live, to teach us that we're all broken and that we need a savior. I pray that you help us today, Lord, as we look at your word, that you might change us and mold us more into your image that we might be a true reflection of what it is to be made in your image. I pray that you might be with our hearts and our minds now, that you would help us not to be distracted as we pay attention to your word, and that you'd be with me, and I wouldn't mess it up too bad. Lord, I thank you for your love for us, which endures even beyond all of our failures and our shortcomings and the things that we have done and the things that uh, we have in our hearts and minds that you're patient with us and we're grateful. So Lord, we present ourselves before you every heart here as your servants. We pray that you might make us like you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So we're back in the book of Luke. We're going to hit, we're going to be in chapter 10. Today's uh, main verse is verse two. The, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's an interesting concept that Jesus is using this metaphor of a harvest. And he's talking about a harvest of souls, not a, a harvest of grain or anything else. And so as we look at that, um, we just need to know that he's speaking in a metaphor. We've been going through the book of Luke in chapter nine. We looked at Jesus sending out the 12. He sent out the 12 disciples. He paired them up and he gave them some instructions. We're going to see some of that repeated as we look here. And he sends out the 70. Uh, the book of Luke, by the way, is the only one that records the sending out of the 70. So we'll take a look at that. And also the feeding of the 5,000. If you remember, they went to the, the house of fish to, to take some time off and the crowds just inundated Jesus. And so he ended up taking care of the needs of everyone and his disciples in the midst of that also got taken care of. So we looked at that. Then we looked at Jesus's destiny and his identity. He reveals himself as he's on the Mount of Transfiguration, his glorified self, the, the person that he truly is before being poured into human flesh. He talks there as he's leaving his Galilean ministry about going to the cross and he says, I need you guys to open your mind, and open your ears and listen to this, that the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. And he begins then setting the stage for what he knows inevitably will be his death, but is our victory over sin because Jesus takes our sin upon his body on the tree. And then as they come down off that mountain, you remember there's a boy at the foot of the mountain who's possessed and the disciples seem to have no ability to cast out this demon. I can just imagine them trying the things they've tried before and having them not work. And Jesus shows up and he has to take care of it. Uh, by the way, if you have any kind of a serious problem with yourself or somebody else, it's always best that you bring them to Jesus, right? It's not that I don't want you to bother me. It's just you, you, you have exclusive rights. You can go right to him if you know him as Savior. Last week, we talked about what it is to be a disciple, and Jesus laid some things down, one of which is that you're to take up your cross and follow me. And there's a, there's a whole set of things that Jesus let us know what it is to be a disciple. And he's going to continue that actually this week with the great harvest. So we'll begin with verse 1 of chapter 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So he has all of these disciples and he chooses 70. Some versions actually say 72 
And that's okay. Because it's a nice even number. And I think that's the important thing. And he sends them out two at a time. And I think that's interesting. And he tells them that there's going to be a harvest. But there are, uh, in Luke chapter 9, we looked at Jesus sending out the 12. And now he picks 70 others. And so we'll see some of those things that are repeated. Except they're not going into the area of Galilee. They're now going south and they're heading towards Jerusalem. So this is a different group and uh, presumably the 12 disciples will be going out as well with the additional 70 and they're going to go out into a Gentile area. They're actually going to go through Samaria, which is the area where Jesus has to go through to get to Jerusalem. So he's sending all of these people out there to let them know that Jesus is coming and to announce his coming, which is pretty cool, which that's what we do, right? So it applies to us. So why 70? Uh, any of you ask questions when you read this, this stuff? Say, why 70? 70 is a kind of a strange number. Why not 90? Or I mean, why not, you know, 34? I mean, you know, well, it's interesting. If you, if you look up 70, which I did through the Bible and spent some time doing it, perhaps the 70 was simply a wise number and made the most effective use of the people at hand. That's what I would think. But then there are scholars who abound. Perhaps it was to identify with the 70 nations listed in Genesis 10. Genesis 10 lists all of these nations of the world. And so to a rabbinic mind or to a Jewish mind, the 70 would include all the Gentiles. And they're going into a Gentile area. And so that kind of makes sense that it may represent that. Perhaps 70 was suggested as a connection with the 70 elders that went up with Moses to Sinai and he saw the glory of God. So in Exodus 24, Jesus chose these 70 to see the glory of God in action and they served and represented him. If you remember, Moses had 70 elders. It's rather interesting. But then it's interesting because there were two other guys that kind of show up and it says the spirit fell on them too. So they ended up having... 72. So whichever number you decide that you're going to land on, it's okay. Perhaps the 70 suggested a connection with the 70 members of the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ruling council. And Jesus showed that he was establishing a new order, a new leadership. So it very well could have been for that reason. Perhaps the 70 suggested a connection with the 70 translators of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, which is called the Septuagint. Uh, Sept meaning 70. So uh, Septuagint and Jesus showed these were the ones to translate his word into everyday life. So you could pick any one of those. Yeah, anyone you like. This is a multi opportunity for you. You can pick anyone or multiples, but Jesus picks 70 and he sends them out two by two. So why would he send them out two by two? Well, I, I always think of what Jesus said in Genesis, and he says, it is not good that man is alone. I don't know about you, but when I'm alone, I'm doing one of two things. Either I'm seeking the Lord or I'm getting in trouble. So, so why two? Why would, why would he send him out because the Jehovah Witnesses do that? Send him out by twos? No, he sends them out two at a time, I think for several reasons. Uh, one, as witnesses, because it's by two or more witnesses that every fact might be established according to the Old Testament, right? In a, in a court of law, you can't just have one person say, I saw this thing. You have to have more than one witness. You have to have, to have two or more, uh, especially if you're going to convict for a capital crime. Help and support, because there's a better return for two than there is for one, right? And a court of three strands is not easily broken, the scripture says. And so we find that there is uh, an exponential labor return when you have more than one person working at anything. And so that's a pretty good thing for help and support for also accountability. Because like I said, either I'm seeking God or I'm getting in trouble when I'm alone. So uh, I'm glad I have accountability. My wife keeps me highly accountable. She, she has my, my f calendar. She knows where I am at any given moment. She's like, hmm, I wonder where my husband is. She could pull it up at any moment in time find me. So it keeps me, keeps me run straight and narrow for accountability. And I think Jesus pairs them up because when you have to pair up with someone else, my goodness, doesn't that stretch you? All the married people are silent. 
Yes, because if you're on your own, you can do what you want, go where you want, say what you want. You're on your own. You can make decisions. You don't have to check with anybody. I can't do that because I'm paired up. It's like a three-legged race. I can't just take off in a direction because I'm attached to my wife, which means I need to say, hey, honey, is it all right if these people come over for dinner? There's only 23 of them. So we'll, <laughs> we'll pack them in. It'll be okay. You, you need me to pick up a pizza or something? So we need to coordinate. And when you have more than one person, you have to work together, right? And it causes us to grow and it causes us to mature as human beings, right? right. right. It doesn't mean you have to like it. It just is a fact that you can't be selfish. You can't be all about you. You have to think about the other person, which is why I think Jesus paired them up two by two. Uh, you can pick any one of those answers too, whichever one of them speaks to you. It's Jesus sent them in advance of his face. It's a, it's a figure of speech. He's, he's sending them on ahead on the map in which he's going to follow and all the cities in which he's going to visit. It's as though he were saying, I'm going to be right behind you guys. So head out there and announce the kingdom of God and I'll be right behind you. And isn't that what we do? We are sent by Jesus Christ to alert people to the fact that there will be a coming judgment in which Christ will come back. And then we will all have to stand before him and give an account of the things done in the body. And so we're, it's very much applicable to us. So we're like the 70. Verse two, and then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's interesting because as they went out, they were kind of predecessors of Jesus coming. And so they were getting ready for the harvest. If you see the picture I selected, I selected it for a very good reason. These guys are actually cutting down the grain and stacking it and getting ready for someone else to come and load it up and put it in the cart. And that's what we do when we share Christ with people. And you don't know if you're planting a seed or if you're actually harvesting, but the Lord's involved in all of that. And so we share about who Jesus is. And how many of you feel like, wow, the harvest is great but the laborers are few. Yeah. How many of you feel that? Yeah. And, it's, and in most churches, it's that way. In fact, in business, they say that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That's the ratio. In church, I think it's much lower than that. It might be 10% of the people do 100% of the work. But the, the, the beautiful thing is that's not the case in our church. We have a we have a bunch of people doing everything. Everybody seems to be chipping in and, and doing something, which I'm thrilled to be part of this body because I can't imagine doing everything that you all do. But this harvest is great. The wonderful thing is, this is a promise. Jesus says the harvest is great, which means all of the inhibitions that I have about sharing about my life and my testimony and about Jesus Christ and what he's done in my life is mostly imagined. Oh, with, people never listen to you. You start telling them about Jesus. You know, they, they think they're good enough and I've heard all the excuses. Okay, so you just shut down and you're not telling anybody, right? I, I wonder if they were going down a road and it said bridge out and the sign fell over if you just let them go. Because the, the weight of eternity, it's, it's, it's not that this life is so hard, but eternity is so long. And if you don't care for people, if you don't have a love in your heart for people to share the gospel with them, you know, you got to scratch your head and say, what's wrong with me? It's a big deal. And Jesus promised that the harvest is plentiful. So I imagine people will respond much more favorably than my imagination and perhaps the devil likes me to believe. The harvest is plentiful. So I don't know if you ever feel alone in the field. I've all I have to do is say that and a song goes off in my head. I have Roger Daltrey yelling at me <laughs> out here in the fields. So are you ready to be a laborer for the kingdom of God? Can you imagine walking with Jesus and, and Jesus saying, you, I want you to be one of the 70. Let's go. I'm going to pair you up with Judas Iscariot. That'd be awesome. <laughs> By the way, he's involved in all this to this point. So I wonder who his tag team partner was. But anyway, we need to be laborers because God needs us. It's interesting that God would use us. And it's, and it's interesting. We can't do anything without him. 
But there are some things he won't do without us. It sounds heretical until you think about it. There are certain things that Jesus asks us to do that he's not going to do without us. So he needs us as his witnesses. He needs us to be obedient so he can do the things that he wants to do. Without him, we can do nothing. But without us, there's a lot of things that he won't do. I think about big things like that sometimes, and it makes me want to take a nap. Verse 3. So Jesus says, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Oh, that's, that's nice. That's a nice warm thought, isn't it? Carry neither money bag nor knapsack nor sandals and greet no one along the road. Well, that just sounds rude. It is the dangerous duty of disciples to become harmless and vulnerable like Jesus. He says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. That's not very comforting. I'd like him to say, I send you out like wolves among sheep. But that's not the case. And he knows that it's going to be difficult. And so to be a witness for Jesus Christ is going to have some friction. It's going to have some difficulty. It's going to have some opposition, isn't it? And it, he also says, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring and ravenous lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, Peter writing to the believers is saying, you're going to have a tough time. I'm glad he gave us the truth. He's not like some army recruiter who only tells you half the truth. He tells you the whole truth and lets you know it's going to be difficult and you got to be on your toes. And I don't know about you, but I'm always thinking of, of scenarios. I walk into a restaurant and I look for the exits and I try to get a seat with my back to a wall. So I have my eye on the door and I try to size up all the people coming in and I figure some moves, how I'm going to how I'm going to move, you know, I assess their abilities and figure out how I'm going to, you know, I did it this morning. It, it's a, it's a, it, I'm damaged. Pray for me. <laughs> be sober, be vigilant. It doesn't mean don't drink. What it means is be level headed and be thoughtful, be careful, make sure you have your wits about you, so to speak, and be vigilant because the devil wants to take you out. We have an enemy and it's not all fun and games and confetti and flowers and, you know, the age of Aquarius and stuff, some serious stuff. He also says, don't take a backpack with you. Don't take a money bag. Don't take extra sandals. And he doesn't mean sandals. He means extra sandals. It's in another verse because this is a short term ministry, right? It's a short term mission trip. You're not going for a long period of time. In fact, later on, Jesus says, if you don't have a sword, buy one. And make sure that you saddle up. Make sure you've got some stuff because you're going on a long-term mission trip now. This was right before he went to the cross. And the, the, suddenly the disciples pulled out their swords. They say, we've got two swords. He goes, that's enough. Don't get carried away. Men and their swords. Short-term missions are not self-reliant. You know, there's, there's a time when we really have to trust God when we step out in faith to do those things that he tells us to do without being prepared. How many of you go camping and just take way too much stuff? How many of you go like on an overnight and you bring like 17 changes of clothes and you need a bag just for your shoes, ladies, you know, because this, you know, this could take two days and you might need seven pairs of shoes. I'm saying nothing. So there are times when the Lord asks us to go without being prepared without having a script, without having money, without even having a direction sometimes. Remember, he went to Abraham and he says, I want you to leave your father's household, I want you to leave all of your relatives and go to a land that I will show you. Can I get a direction here, Lord? You know, no, I'll show you. So when you're packed, let me know and then I'll tell you. I don't know about you, but I find that very disquieting. I like to know where I'm going, how long it's going to take. I want to allocate time. I want to know who's involved. I want to know everything. I'm, I'm, I'm a hyper control freak that way. But I'm learning 
that I need to trust God and do what he tells me to do and know that he's going to provide for me as I go. And that can be a very difficult lesson to learn, but it grows us so that we can be more like him. But it takes faith and trust. And we can't always prepare for every contingency. And so those of you who enjoy security of having everything figured out, God's going to cause you to get out of your shell. And you're going to have to take a step in faith and do that which he calls you to do when you don't know what's going to happen. He also says, don't greet anyone along the road. Now, that just sounds rude. He doesn't mean don't say hello. What he means is don't get tangled up. Don't get distracted and engaged in entanglements. And remember that you're on a mission for the master. Uh, Any of you who have ADD or any semblance of that, Know what it is when you go to do one thing and you're suddenly distracted by a second thing, which makes you distracted by a third thing. And finally, you walk into a room and you go, why did I come in this room? That's what Jesus is talking about. Don't get distracted. Remember your mission. Make sure you keep a singular vision on doing the things that the Lord would have you do. Because if we don't, very often we can get lost in the sauce, right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, good. I'm not the only one. Verse five, but whatever house you enter, by the way, that's what they would do. They would go to a city and they would find some good couple who would take them in. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you and remain in that same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages, and do not go from house to house. He says don't go from house to house more than once, doesn't he? So he must have meant it. Well, first of all, when you go into a place, what you do is you bring peace. You pray for God's peace to fall upon the place, because you know what it is when you have a guest come into your house? It can be very disturbing, like, um, I require the bathroom at, uh, from seven to nine in the morning. And, uh, I require eggs over easy, uh, lightly salted. And, you know, like you can have people walk into your house and they're just like a gigantic drain on you. Right. Some of, you know, some of you have married these people. I get it. He says, when you go into a house, the first thing you want to do is present a blessing. You want to pray God's blessing on that house. You want to pray God's peace on that house. You want to ask that God would come and you are then being a servant on behalf of those people. You're not, you know, giving orders and saying, give me, give me. You're there to be a blessing to them and you're praying for them right off the bat. How cool is that? How would you like somebody to come into your house and say, brother, I am so glad that you had me come over. I just want to, I just want to pray over your house and over our relationship right now. That's different. So he says, the very first thing you do is pray God's peace because you're, you're marching into their lives, using their bathroom and their stuff and pray that God would add an extra measure of his peace. And so uh, this is from Numbers 6, 24 to 26, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I think maybe this is what Jesus was trying to encapsulate was this blessing. So There's the blessing. He says, don't go from house to house. You know, when, when somebody says, yeah, you can stay with me and you get close to the house and you go, what do you got here? Like 800 square feet. (laughs) Just kind of hoping for my own room, just the couch, huh? Well, listen, Hey, thanks for the offer. I, you know, I, I'm going to go check with your neighbors. That's what Jesus doesn't want you to do because it's not about your comfort. It's not about you at all. It's about him. And we can, come be, we can become distracted by those comforts, can't we? And Jesus spoke that when he spoke it to the twelves as well. And he says, remain in that house. Don't go bouncing around. Don't look for the bigger, better deal. Make sure you stay there. And whatever eating and drinking and such things as they give you, receive it. Whatever it is they give you, make sure that you receive it. And the scripture says here in 1 Timothy 5.18, says, For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while it treads out grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. The laborer is worthy of his wages. You see the little quotation marks? They actually take that from Mark or from Luke chapter 10. 
That's interesting. Timothy's quoting the gospels here. And so this is where it originates. And he later on, uh, Timothy, um, uh, or Paul is sending this to Timothy and he quotes. So why don't you muzzle the ox while he's treading out grain? Because he's doing a valuable service by treading out this grain and helping you to sift through it. And every once in a while, you might get down there and, and have a face full of granola. So don't put a muzzle on him so that he can't do that. Let him eat because he has a right to a portion of it because he's working it. And so that's what that means. And so whatever food it is that people give you, make sure you eat it. It could be a lettuce sandwich with tang. You know, it could be almost anything. And, and the scripture says, just, just take it. Learn to be a gracious receiver of hospitality. You know what it is to be a gracious receiver of hospitality? Somebody offers something, you go, oh, I'm kind of off gluten. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Do you have any filet mignon here today? Oh, I'm kind of trying to lay off the carbs, you know. Don't do that. Be a gracious receiver and don't get weird about it. If people want to give you a gift, what's the best thing that you can say? Thank you. Oh, you guys are so well educated. That's good. <laughs> yes, learn to say thank you. Learn to be a gracious receiver because in receiving a gift from somebody giving, who do you truly bless? The giver. See, we don't think of it that way. We think, oh, you know, you shouldn't have done it. You know, don't do it. I'm not worthy. You know, like there are all the things that we go through. <laughs> Be a gracious receiver. And I'll tell you what, I fight, I fight that. Because I'm like, I don't need nothing. I got everything I need. But truly, it is a blessing when people give. And it is a blessing to receive from people giving of course, with a, a heart of thankfulness. So be a, be a good, gracious receiver. Verse eight, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you. Whatever. Whatever they put before you. That really takes some faith, doesn't it? Especially if you're a missionary and you go to another country and they eat things like you've never even heard that you could eat. The scripture says, don't let that become the issue because that can become a distraction from your mission, right? So, and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. There's another interesting sandwich. <laughs> Olives with pimentos on bread with peanut butter. Peanut butter. The internet says it's one of the worst combinations that you could ever have. So I put it up there. But you know what? I'm committed to do what God tells me to do. And you know what? I'm going to eat that thing. Just as sure as I put my kids, you know, pictures up on the refrigerator and I have no idea what it is. They slurried paint everywhere. I don't know what it is, but I'm putting it up. And isn't that what the Lord does with us? Because everything that we do for him is just like, like finger paint. Anyway. In 1 Corinthians 10, 24 to 27, it says, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without asking questions of conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness. It's actually from Deuteronomy. And if any of you, uh, and if any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you asking no questions for conscience sake. Isn't that interesting? I have too many stories. I'm too old. You need a younger pastor who's never experienced weird things. It says that we're not to make that an issue. That's not the reason you live. You eat to stay alive. You don't live to eat. And it's not all about that. So, and you know what, in our, in our society, we're talking about paleo, talking about carbs, talking about, you know, all of this crazy stuff. We can get so focused on that, that we miss that we're on mission for Jesus Christ. And it says, heal the sick that are there and say to them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. 
You see, the healing of the sick is to authenticate their message of God's love. Heal them. He's sending them out with the power to cast out demons, to heal, and to preach. And he says, this is how you do it, guys. This is how missions is supposed to happen. I think it's very interesting. This compassion and service to others will authenticate our witness when we place others before ourselves. It's another way of considering the other person instead of your own self. So if they're sick, if there's a malady, you deal with that. In fact, it says in James 5, it says that if anyone's sick, they should come before the elders of the church and anoint him with oil and the prayer offered in faith will heal such a one. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So sometimes it's connected to a sin, and yet the way you deal with it is by confession, and there's healing. So, you guys are suddenly very quiet in here. <laughs> but whatever city you enter, if they do not receive you, now this is the other side of the coin, go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. It's interesting, the person that gets healed in the house gets the same message as the people outside the house. The kingdom of God has come near to you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom, and, for Sodom than for that city. If you go into a city and you're going to share the gospel and you're going to tell people about Jesus Christ, or whether you go into an individual and do that, what happens when they shut you down? Well, you press harder, right? You put on all of your sales skills and you make sure you corner them. <laughs> you scare them with hell and brimstone, right? No, that's not the way. You may have seen it that way, but it's not that way. So you kick the dust from your feet. Well, what's that supposed to be? It's like I told you. You've been warned. That's what it is. And I'm not taking any of the dust from your town. I don't want a thing from you guys. I'm gonna, I, don't, I don't want to take any of this with me. You've been told. You've got no excuse. That, that's a little scary. My wife has this interesting tactic. I'm going to pretend she's not here because I can't look at her and say this. <laughs> she was convicted by the Lord that she's a nagger, or she used to be. I know none of you ever do that, but this was her particular thing. And so she would tell me things and she'd write me to-do lists and all this kind of stuff to help me. And then what she did was she would get my attention and she'd say, I'm going to say this one time and I'm never going to speak another word about it. That caught my attention. And she has not nagged since. She merely says, I'm going to say this one time and then I will never say it again. And she's, and she doesn't, and she submits to God and she goes, God, I told him, so you're going to have to, you know, press it into his heart because I'm done. And boy, she's a much happier person. But you see, when she does that, it's like kicking the dust from her feet. And she goes, listen, you were warned. I told you once, if you don't deal with this or if you don't call so-and-so, or if you don't address this thing, it's going to blow up and you're going to be so sorry because she's usually the person that's more concerned with the hearts of other people than I am. And I learned a lot from her. So if you want to tell somebody something, tell them, listen, I'm going to tell you one time and I'll never mention it again. Do you know what an opportunity that is for you to, to fix it? And if you're a, you know, if you're a bonehead like me, you'll just forget, right? Unless somebody tells you, this is it. I'm telling you once. I won't tell you again. It works. For those of you who have a problem with nagging because you need to control other people in that way, it doesn't control them. It just makes you miserable. So tell them once and tell them that you're only telling them once and you'll never mention it again. And you're going to leave it with the Lord. I didn't even plan on talking about that. But anyway, <laughs> shake the dust off your feet. It's a little like what happened with Pilate when he went before the group and they wanted to have Jesus put on a cross and die. And he says, listen, I find nothing wrong with this guy. And it's that time of year when I let people go. So should I let him go? And they said, no, you get this other guy. He's a murderer. We want him. And so he let Bar Barabbas go. 
And Pilate went before them and washed his hands. And he goes, listen, I'm innocent of this whole thing, of this man's blood. So do whatever you want. But see, what he did wasn't right because he did have the power to change it, but he didn't have the guts to do it. So he washed his hands and he says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. As a disciple, we know the eternal importance of our message and the consequence of receiving what we have earned. You, you, you know what it is that we have earned, right? It says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We know the gravity of what it is for someone not to receive the message to be reconciled to God. We get that. Other people don't. So it's a big deal. As a disciple, we need to understand that and communicate that. That it's not just a, it's an easy peasy, you know, add Jesus to the recipe of your life and, and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and you'll be rich, and, and you'll never have any trouble whatsoever, and you can wake up early every morning and have devotions, and it'll be so easy. No, that's not the case. He says, if they don't listen when you come, it's better for the city of Sodom. And if you know what happened with Sodom, there were some angels that showed up and took the righteous out, including Lot, his wife, and his daughters, and uh, his wife ended up turning around anyway. But these people were so twisted, they weren't in the position to repent at all. And so God rained down on them fire and judged them, but only after pulling his people out, which is what a country does, by the way, to their ambassadors. If you, if you notice, you've seen some indications that some of our ambassadors are getting pulled out of certain countries. That's what you do before you go to war. Because you want to get your people out. You don't want to bomb the country your ambassadors are in, right? God does the same. In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. What we deserve is eternal punishment because we're born rebels against God's will. But the free gift, it's there for the asking, asking God to forgive you and give you a new life and straighten out your heart and your mind. It's free. It's there for the asking. It's like a check that you can put in any amount and all you have to do is go cash it. That's what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Verse 13, woe to you, Chorazin. By the way, it's a town just north of the area where they are. Woe to you, Bethsaida, which is the house of fish. For if the mighty works were done in you that had been done, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So Tyre and Sidon, these big big cities that are known for their sin, like every big city is. You know, it doesn't matter if it's San Francisco or New York City or Las Vegas. I mean, they're, they're all known for that. He says, if you don't listen, he goes, it's going to be worse for you in the judgment because you knew better, because you had a greater witness. In John 21, 25, there were also many other things in which Jesus did, of which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Because there's nothing in the, in the scriptures recorded about what happened in Chorazin. There's, there's no witness at all in the scripture about what Jesus did there to say such a thing against them. But we do know about the other city, right? The house of fish. That's where he went with his disciples. And suddenly there were 5,000 men, which may have been 10,000 people. And he ended up sitting them all down in groups and feeding them. And yet a miracle doesn't necessarily change a human heart, does it? And he's like, hey, guys, if I went to another town and did this, they would have been in sackcloth and ashes and they would have repented. You guys got to see this free miracle that came about and you guys all ate until you were completely filled off a little boy's lunch. And yet your heart didn't change. It's tougher for you in the judgment because you know better. And that's the principle. In fact, uh, Dante picks that up when he talks about his levels of hell, the rings of hell, if you're familiar with Dante, that there are certain depths, there are people apparently that will get more, I don't think, you know, Hitler is going to be on the same rung with everybody else. I think there's a special place for him. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to the heaven. Uh, Capernaum was a very wealthy city. They had fishing and trade, and it's where Jesus set up his ministry. 
will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me. He's speaking to the 70 going out. He who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Isn't that interesting? When you speak a word, you're not speaking on your own authority. You're pointing to Jesus, and Jesus is sent by the Father. It's a package. So if they reject you, they're not just rejecting you, are they? They're rejecting Christ, and they're rejecting God himself because you're his messenger. So all of these folks in Capernaum who saw all of the miracles that Jesus did, he says, it's not going to be any good for you because you saw something no one else saw. The Messiah himself in a time and place came and you witnessed him with your very own eyes. Luke 12, 47 to 48 says, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, to him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, to, of him they will ask the more. So there's this responsibility of stewardship. The more that you have, the more you're responsible for. The more information you get, the more you're going to be held accountable to act on it. Which is a scary thing. To think that there are people who don't, haven't put their faith in Jesus who go to church every single Sunday and they know so much more than the average person and yet they don't do anything about it. It's going to be held accountable for the things that we know. And Mark 4, 24 and 25, and Jesus said to them, take heed what you hear. At the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, but to whoever does not have, even that which he has will be taken away from him. So Jesus basically said, if you don't use it, you lose it. You guys have heard that, right? It's the Jersey version. You don't use it, you lose it. If you listen and you pay attention to the, the light that God gives you, he gives you more. And if you don't and you shut it down, well, then no more will be given to you. In fact, what's been given to you will be taken away, which is scary. Makes me want to pay attention. Verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, if you remember, he told the 12 this when they got back and they were all excited and, uh, they, you know, they wanted to tell their stories. And so they went to the house of fish and they got invaded by a crowd. He says, yeah, I understand that the spirits listen to you. I'm the one to give you the authority to do that, to trample on snakes and scorpions. I, I don't know. You know, we don't have too many of those running around anymore, but Jesus gets all of these guys coming back with joy. And he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Actually, there's, there's four fallings of Satan actually in the scriptures. And, and each one goes to a different level. Um, and if you want to find them, there's Ezekiel chapter 28, where he went from being a glorified cherub, where God sent him down to the earth, um, having access to heaven in Job chapter one before uh, the throne and uh, ultimately in Kings 22 and Zechariah 3 to the restriction of the earth. You see that in Revelation 12, 9. And then from the earth to bondage in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, which is what's called the millennium. And that's in Revelation chapter 21 to 3. And then he goes from the pit to the lake of fire, which is the ultimate destination where he'll finally be done away with and along with pain and death. So that's a, that's a pretty good fall. I'm glad for those things to fall away says you'll trample on snakes. It's a euphemism, okay? It doesn't mean go find a snake and you can step on him and you'll be okay, especially if it's a rattlesnake or a big gigantic snake like this. Don't play with snakes. There are some people that take this scripture and they think Jesus didn't mean what he said and they, they handle snakes. Look, I get rattlesnakes. I'm cool. A lot of those guys die. Oh, well, they just didn't have enough faith, I guess. Jesus was saying you have power over, you have spiritual power over snakes and scorpions. The snake being the common symbol of Satan and scorpions as well. There are passages for that. But 
He says, I'm the one that gives you the power over those things. And he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. It doesn't mean that uh, there was, it was lightning. It was like lightning. In other words, it was quick. It was fast. It was just him raising his heart up to say, I will ascend to be like the most high. And that was it. God took him out. There was no battle. There's no arm wrestling between the devil and God. It was a done deal. Verse 21. In that hour, Jesus received the spirit and said, rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. I don't know if I was one of the 70, if I'd appreciate that, but you call me a baby? <laughs> Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. And Jesus said, I, I didn't pick a bunch of, you know, high class scholars here. I picked a bunch of ordinary babes, infants in their understanding, innocent. That's what Jesus said. I wonder if he'd say that about you or me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 25 to 29, it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, that's you and me, to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world, that's us, to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things, these, these are the low things, that's, that's us too, of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God picks the worst people, and then he cleans them up so there'll be no mistake that it was his action. You might not feel that way, but it doesn't matter how you feel. That's what the Bible says. And I know it's true of me. I was lost. I was on my way to being a, I don't even want to say. Second Corinthians 4, 7, it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence and the power may be of God and not of us. He calls us a bunch of clay pots. Dress me up, but I'm still a clay pot. Shave off my beard, but I'm still a clay pot. You try to dress me up, make me smell good. It won't last for long. I'm a clay pot. But God pours his glory into us. Amen? Amen. By the way, these were the kind of clay pots that they put the scrolls into, which you might know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's just rather interesting, which gives a completely new understanding to what it is to be a clay pot. These things sat for years and years and years until a little boy threw a rock in a cave in Qumran and broke one of these vessels. And he goes, what was that? Went up there and found these all these scriptures that were all rolled up and kept inside of these clay pots. The clay pot doesn't mean much, but what it contains was incredibly valuable. And so that's what you and I are. And I would hope that the word of God is in you as well. And 22, and all these things have been delivered to me by my father. And no one knows the son except the father and who the father is except the son. And the one to whom the son reveals him. And then he turned to his disciples and he said privately, blessed are your eyes, which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it. And to hear what you hear and have not heard it. Do you realize that God has conferred to you the secret? above all secrets, which isn't really a secret, but he has opened our eyes to understand who Jesus is and why he came, that we might have a relationship with God, that we have someone who's taken our punishment and our shame away. The world doesn't understand that. I mean, I, I said this last week, anybody within the hearing of my voice is in the top 1% of the wealth of this world. If you have shoes, a roof over your head, and running plumbing inside your house and you're not sweating a meal, you were in the top 1% of riches in this world. We are all rich. And yet, 
I don't feel that way all the time. I don't feel like I have everything I want. Sometimes my want is way, way bigger than what I own. And that's the problem with me. It says in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant or a slave and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. Did you know that there are those under the earth? Hmm. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Humiliation determines exaltation. Humiliation determines exaltation. As Jesus is telling the 70, be humble, don't ask a lot, don't impose on people, be, be people who give, but make sure you tell them the truth and you warn them, kick the dust off your feet and warn them. He tells them exactly how to be, and it's an image of who Jesus was. Because if you remember, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He wasn't asking them to do anything that he wasn't doing himself, and he's God in human form which is a mind blower. But he gets exalted because of that. And I find this principle, your exaltation is always determined by your degree of humiliation. So how low will you go? Not, not, you know, not the limbo, but how, how low are you willing to humiliate yourself and serve other people and serve the Lord ultimately? That's going to determine your exaltation because there is no resurrection without a crucifixion. And Jesus shows us what kind of life Christians live. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people giving us bad press, not living the life. Jesus shows us how to live by humbling himself on the cross and then ultimately being exalted. And he's now sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. All these things have been delivered. Jesus says in 14, 6 to 9, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Notice the Notice the article, the, I'm not a way, a truth and a life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. That's a statement of exclusivity, isn't it? I wonder if people believe the gospel is exclusive. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him. And have seen him. Jesus saying this to his disciples. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? It's one of the strongest statements that Jesus gives about his deity, about him being God, the son. And yet, People will try to say, well, oh, he didn't mean what he said. He means something completely other than what he just said. No, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father, no woman, no child, no person comes to the Father except through his sacrifice and through his death. And that's the gospel, boys and girls, that we are twisted and broken and we need a Savior. And Jesus is there and he offers it to us freely. As in the first century, we are living in a time of unprecedented privilege and opportunity. And Jesus says, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into his field. So we have a list here with the 70 being sent out and coming back of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. He set down the principles in the previous chapter about taking up your cross and all of that. But now he's telling us some other things specifically to these 70. Disciples pair up, by the way. It, it's, always the, it's always the lone sheep that gets picked off in the field. We're supposed to connect. We're supposed to come together. 
Disciples pair up. Disciples go because that's what Jesus said. He says, go and tell. Disciples prepare for Jesus because he's coming back. Disciples harvest souls, not just harvesting things. Disciples pray for help. Pray that the Lord of the harvest sends laborers into his field. Disciples travel light because we're on a mission. We don't got bogged down with all of the thorns and the cares of this world and stuff. We want to be light because we're on a mission. Disciples bring peace and our gracious guests. I'll have to work on that. Full of compassion and service for others. With gravity, warn those who would disregard Jesus. Understand the eternal consequences of denying their need. Take authority and value their salvation. Show humility as beggars who have received a free gift because we're beggars who have received bread and we're just telling someone else where to get it. And knows the honor of living in times of unprecedented privilege and opportunity. Guys, I don't see this world lasting a whole lot longer. Amen. And there's a window of opportunity for us to share the gospel because it's something we'll never do in heaven. It'll be done. Mm -hmm. And if there are people that you know and that you love who don't have a relationship, they don't have a conversational, relational connection to God through Jesus Christ, they need to hear what you know and just take for granted every single day. It's like that when you receive something, it's like a new car or anything else. You get it and you're excited and you have it. And then eh, you start breaking the rules. Like I never used to eat in my car or drink coffee in my car because I didn't want to stain it. But now who cares? You know, you get one scratch or one dent and you go, ah, that's it. Sometimes our salvation could be something that we disregard in that way because it's not new to us. And yet God's mercies are new every morning. And we can come and get a fresh view of what God's done. And I hope you guys have an understanding of what Jesus is teaching here. Because if we take it to heart, the Lord can really do things with us. Because the harvest is great, Jesus said. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing more exciting than being in the service of the King of Heaven. Amen?